Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Okay, so uh, beam your questions in. Um, let's see, I'll start off here while we're waiting for them to come, I guess for, for either of you. Um, in the change of administration that we had, the US policy towards climate change has you know, changed pretty dramatically. Um, How's the rest of the world taking this? Um, is, uh, is everybody leaving Paris, or are people just persevering? What's happening? Uh, Valerie, do you want to start with that? Sure, yeah, I mean, I can give a little color to what I see in here on the ground, um, particularly in China. So um, I think that, you know, the US uh, uh, taking the official position that they, that the administration would leave the Paris Accord, I think is, has been symbolically very uh, damaging at a world scale to US reputation. And China sees that as, uh, at least at a sort of formal international level, I think as an opportunity to uh, step into a leadership role. Um, at the same time, I think what's happened is on the ground, it is actually and have eased off the pressure. So um, uh, just around the edges, enough to notice, I think, that there's, there's sort of uh, maybe a slowdown a little bit in sort of the momentum that I've seen on the ground in terms of, if you look at, for example, China's um, emissions trading system, I think um, it's actually provided an opportunity to say, OK, we don't have to rush this forward. We'll take incremental steps. That may be good, but it's just in terms of the sense of urgency, I think it actually on the ground has, has pulled back. But at sort of the symbolic international level, China has seen this as an opportunity to really step up. And beyond that, I think there are a lot of countries in between that are sort of struggling and thinking, sort of where do we align and what can we do and how do we make progress in a world where there's um, where there isn't such a strong consensus as there was. That said, there's a lot going on at the state level in the US, and I'm optimistic about that. Great, okay. Um, Janelle, um, as you said in your talk, climate change is viewed kind of as a market failure. Um, we, the way to deal with something that you have that you don't want is to put a price on it, mm -hmm. okay? Politicians tend not to like prices because taxes uh, are anathema to them. Um, so being in this situation, what's the best way to make progress or to start to make progress? Yeah, so I think I agree with the president's statement um, the be at the beginning of this morning's events where he basically said we need political will. And I think that's absolutely crucial. And that's not to say that we don't need a market price or that we don't need economics. I think that that's integral to the solution. But more than that, we need politicians who are willing to direct rapid energy transition. And the technologies exist, or they're being developed. I mean, I think MIT is absolutely a hub of that. It's really just a problem of how do you bring the technologies to market? How do you disseminate them? And that, unfortunately, I think is less of an economic problem and more of a political problem. OK. Um, Valerie. We've heard that China is funding and building coal-powered power in Africa. It seems like as China defossilizes, it's making sure that there's a long-term market for its coal. Are they actively shifting their carbon footprint to other places? I mean, I think you know every uh, nation, that, a nation that has developed has shifted its energy footprint to other parts of the world. So I would, if you look, at, for example, at um, China, where domestically China's carbon has originated uh, over the past 10, 20 years, more than 20% of that is attributable to uh, production of goods that are ultimately exported from China. So I think um, I'm not by any means sidestepping the question. I think, though, that it is important to recognize that um, uh, every developed nation has has essentially outsourced its energy footprint at some point. I think that this is happening to a certain degree with China today, and this is absolutely a reason to focus on uh, getting, uh, scrutinizing the environmental 
characteristics of the coal plants that are being built in Southeast Asia, that are being built in Africa. Some of these are ultra supercritical technologies that China is eager to export, others are not so clean. I think um, the other, the bright spot here is that China also has a lot of solar and a lot of wind, especially solar, that it is very keen to export electric vehicles, that it is keen to lead in terms of new brands, and so those may also contribute um, to reducing carbon at the same time as we still have, of course, we want to we want to be very clear about what's happening with China's uh, coal builds around the world. Okay. All right, Chanel. Do the large fossil fuel companies have an inherent bias towards slowing decarbonization because they want to generate profits from their assets still in the ground? So. Yeah, it's a good question. I think. <laughs> the obvious answer is yes, right? You know, chuckles, <laughs> chuckles in the, in the audience. But I think that if the if the petroleum industry is really smart about this, they won't just think short term because the answer to that question is yes in the short term. In the long term, though, they're much better to start thinking about the fact that the energy transition is inevitable, whether it's a matter of technological progress or it's a matter of responding to climate change. It will happen, and so the question is gonna be who's gonna be the leader of that transition? And so I think this is more reflected more broadly in a kind of way in which we frame the discourse around climate change. One of the things I studied in my book was the differences in different regions. In the United States, there's this tendency to emphasize the negatives, the cost, the challenge of, of decarbonization. And in Europe, which has really taken the lead in decarbonizing, the discourse is much more around the opportunity, the economic benefit. You can think about things like the Stern Review, right, that produced the first really strong statement about the positive economic effect of decarbonizing. And so I think if the industry takes that same approach and they stop thinking about their quarterly returns and start thinking about who they're going to be in 100 years, they'll take the lead on this issue. Yeah. Well, change brings opportunity, and somebody's going to profit from that. So. Yeah. Um, OK, for either of you, um, comment on advanced nuclear technologies and the political hurdles to get them accepted. <laughs> Happy to take that. I, I guess uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a tough question. I think um, there's, there are essentially only a couple of countries that are still really active in growing their nuclear fleets uh, today. So um, China is one of them, um, but China may not need all the nuclear it's expecting. Um, and then uh, uh, South Korea, um, and, and so there are a couple of other examples. I think if you come back to the U.S. now, one of the you know, greatest realizations for us is that we're actually losing not just momentum on new builds, but also on the capabilities that we need, the scientific and technical capabilities that we need to manage and, and, um, and uh, essentially plan for the future for the nuclear fleet that we have and any potential growth. And I, I don't really, unfortunately, I wish I had better news for you, but I, I don't see those, um, those regulatory uh, hurdles as well as those sort of uh, challenges in maintaining capabilities as going away anytime soon. And this is an opportunity, I think, for um, the government to, to really think hard about whether we want to lead in this technology. We had a very important role to play in the development, and, uh, and this is going to be central going forward in our sort of international security relations, I think, as well. Okay. Um, methane leakage and livestock generated methane. How do, you, how do you measure it? How do you price it? <laughs> <laughs> our, our alums are not methane easy on you guys. Leakage. No, they're not. Um, it actually brings to mind composting for, for some reason, that that's actually a really effective way to reduce methane leakage. I don't know where the, the question was going. I think agriculture is a big challenge, you know, and it, it maybe pushes this question about lifestyle choices. Um, methane is a major contributor to greenhouse, to the greenhouse gas effect. 
And so a, a big portion of that comes from agriculture, so the way in which we consume food and resources. And I think there's a range of studies that show the demonstrated effect in terms of land use, in terms of water, in terms of carbon dioxide of being vegetarian. Um, so, you know, again, like I realize that's a, that's a social value, very controversial. Um, but I, I do think that there's certainly, that's one of the answers is just, it's not capturing methane, it's not um, preventing methane. Well, it, it's preventing methane by changing our diet. The other thing is composting, that we could be doing more on a municipal and a city scale to compost and to do that in an anaerobic um, procedure so that you can utilize the methane gas for natural gas production. Okay, all right, uh, one last question here, because um, we're out of time. Um, how do we go from being Louisiana to being Norway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hats off to whoever came up with that one out there. So. Yeah, how do we, you know, and again, it's all, I think it's all about it is about social values, and it's the things that are valued in the way in which society is established, but it's also about really strong regulatory policy. Wealth doesn't just reproduce itself. It has to be, and, and, and doesn't embed itself within society, within communities. It has to be embedded. It has to be managed. And so, again, that requires really strong regulation, and it requires a really active, I guess, social, social welfare system that protects the well-being of society. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Sure. Just, I, I would say you, know, you, you want to make it possible, in fact, desirable for today's leading energy companies to be involved with and lead the way on some of these new technologies. I think um, there is appetite for it, but there are maybe there are regulatory or other constraints. Um, I think we need to think about the climate problem as not just one of getting the policies right, but also the institutional rules need to encourage uh, companies in direct, and Norway is a prime example of this, um, reward them for, for taking uh, steps in a cleaner direction. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both for those uh, great presentations, and thanks for, the, thanks for the great questions from the audience. So, so we're going to take a break. Uh, we'll be back at 1040. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.